Good evening, what a great group. Welcome, thank you for being here. I'm Vince Cipolla, President of the Municipal Arts Society. Thank you all for joining us at tonight's Arts Forum. And thank you to the National Museum of the American Indian and John Hayworth for having us. Thank you, John. Where are you, John? Uh, MAS is very pleased to continue the long tradition of the Arts Forum a sponsored project of the New York Foundation for the Arts with funding provided by the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Since 1990, the forum has brought the best and brightest in arts innovators in all disciplines to a broad audience, and we are proud to continue this legacy now at MAS. As you may know, MAS is a membership organization, which is important because it means our work reflects what matters to New Yorkers to you especially on issues that affect the livability and resilience of the city. I hope we can count on you to attend our dynamic programming, such as tonight's. And if you're not already a member of MAS, I hope you'll become one tonight. As a member, you can participate directly in shaping the livability agenda of this city and hold us accountable for ensuring our research, community training, convening, and public programming efforts reflect your concerns. MAS has some very exciting projects coming up. Next weekend, on May 5th and 6th, we'll be joining over 80 cities around the world to host Jane's Walks in New York City. More than 50 free neighborhood walks in all five boroughs honoring the legacy of Jane Jacobs. You can go to mas.org to find a walk or two that interests you. I'll put in a plug for my walk, uh, Union Square to Columbus Circle Broadway. Um, and, we're, and we're also gearing up to celebrate the 25th anniversary of our Adopt a Monument program, which has served as a national model with the restoration of the rocket thrower in Flushing Meadows Corona Park in Queens. More information on all of our initiatives is available at mas.org, where we will also post a video recording of tonight's panel. MAS is very pleased to be co-hosting tonight's Arts Forum with our good friends at Art Place, a national consortium of funders investing in creative placemaking across the country. Art Place is providing critical leadership and resources on issues that are at the core of the MAS livability agenda. And tomorrow, with support from the Rockefeller Foundation, MAS and Art Place will be convening an all-day working session, building on tonight's discussion on how to measure vibrancy and dynamism how to quantify those unique, often qualitative, know it when you see it, characteristics that shape successful neighborhoods. Now, we are so thrilled that Carol Coletta, who directs Art Place, is joining us as tonight's moderator. Prior to joining Art Place, Carol was president and CEO of CEOs for Cities, a national network of urban leaders building and sustaining the next generation of great American cities. Welcome, Carol. Thank you, Vin, and thanks very much to MAS for uh, sponsoring this public forum that we could have as a result of um, the Rockefeller Foundation, Eddie Torres, our great colleague at Rockefeller who made tomorrow happen, and we could have some good colleagues in town uh, and do this public program tonight. Let me just say also that without uh, Vin's great colleagues, uh, Mary Rowe and Ann Coates, uh, we wouldn't be here. They've been so fabulously cooperative. I agree. And then I, I want to thank all of you for being here for this discussion. Let me just give you the very briefest of introductions to Art Place. It's an exciting collaboration, um, sort of unprecedented, uh, among the nation's, uh, some of the nation's largest foundations, uh, both national foundations as well as regional foundations. Uh, banks and federal agencies to accelerate creative placemaking across the country. What we're really trying to do is spark a movement uh, and coalesce a lot of the great efforts that have been going on around the country uh, in local communities and sort of, uh, you know, make more of that happen. Uh, to date, we've made about $11.5 million in grants in 34 uh, communities. 
Um, and we are just on the verge of making another uh, 15 plus million dollars in grants in this second round, probably to announce that in June and up to $12 million in loans that we will announce later this year. Now, Art Place defines creative placemaking as investments in art and culture that are at the heart of a portfolio of integrated strategies that are meant to drive vibrancy and diversity powerful enough to transform communities. So that's the way, it, that's the business that we believe we're in. So we're not narrowly defining creative placemaking in terms of what it is, the, the templates or the, um, the activities. Instead, what we're defining very specifically is what it is that we hope creative placemaking will drive. In other words, there's a particular out, set of outcomes that we're seeking, and those outcomes are diversity, and, um, and vibrancy, and, and we can talk some more during the panel discussion, perhaps, about why that is, why we've chosen to focus there, uh, because there's a theory of change that underlies all of this. But, you know, if you say, well, we want to drive vibrancy and diversity, it's like, okay, but what is that? As Ben said, how do you know it when you see it? And when we began to ask those questions, uh, we turned to uh, my longtime colleague, Joe Courtright, to help us answer that question. And I'm going to turn it back to Vin to introduce Joe. And, uh, you know, I'm really going, just to, come on up. Uh, during the panel discussion, we're going to be talking to uh, some creative placemakers and, and, um, and Kevin, who's another uh, researcher uh, who's done great work in this, in this area. But, you know, as Joe talks, I really hope you will think about what resonates for you and what he says, what seems right and what seems wrong, uh, because we're in the, in, in the, we're at the stage in our work now that we're trying to actively to get pushback. What's wrong here? What's missing here? What doesn't resonate? So I hope you will listen with those ears. Thanks. Thank you so much, Carol. This is such a fun format. I get up, you get up, I get up, you get up, I get up. I love this. I love that. I'm honored to be the introducer. Presenting his initial research on vibrancy indicators is economist Joe Courtright, who is president and principal economist for Impressa, a Portland consulting firm specializing in regional economic analysis, innovation, and industry clusters. Joe, who spoke at the 2010 inaugural MAS Summit for New York City, is a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and senior policy advisor for CEOs for Cities. Joe. Th thank you, Vin, and, and thanks for that introduction. And, and thank you to Carol for this wonderful challenge. I've, I've, I've worked with Carol for almost 10 years now, and Carol is the, as I like to think of, is the muse of city. She always asks the most interesting questions, and I hope you'll help us with the answers tonight. And I appreciate that this, this is kind of a cross-cultural communication event here. I'm representing the soulless bean counters of the world, the, the economics profession. You probably all know the definition of, ec of an economist. It's somebody who's good with numbers but doesn't have the personality to be an accountant. Um, <laughs> but much as we are here in the shadow of Wall Street, I am mindful of the fact that that definition no longer applies. Uh, now it's the case that an economist is somebody who's good with numbers but isn't creative enough to be an accountant, um, which is hopefully something that gives us entree to talk about creativity in the arts and to talk specifically about developing a set of measures, it's really an imponderable really, a set of measures of vibrancy in communities and that's the task before us today. So briefly, the objectives of the Art Place program are twofold. Nominally, it's to come up with a set of indicators that let us understand the impacts of our investments. But really what we're, our long-term objective is, I think, is to trigger a conversation about the role that arts play in driving uh, community revitalization and uh, what constitutes vibrancy. And we want to have a broad conversation with, the, with, with this community and other communities in developing those, those indicators. Our theory of change in art place, as Carol alluded to, uh, is to make investments in improving the vibrancy and the diversity of communities in ways that lead to uh, an improvement in quality of place 
uh, that then uh, triggers uh, economic revitalization in a community. So we're about these sort of middle parts of the process here and then observing what happens uh, in those communities. Um, the role of indicators in the process, and I'll just highlight one thing here. With our indicators, the indicators are just that. We're not literally measuring the vibrancy. We're trying to find the traces, the footprints, the shadows that vibrancy casts. So when I show you the sample of indicators here, keep in mind we don't, we're not literally equating those things with vibrancy. We're saying they are indicators of places where vibrancy we think is happening, although vibrancy is much richer and, and, and probably less well-defined or than is suggested by our indicators. We have some design principles in pulling together our data. Uh, we basically want to build a system that will work throughout the entire United States uh, that is transparent to end users, that is you can see what the, where the data comes from and what it means, um, that it'll be flexible and scalable, and that importantly that we can gather the data over time so that we can measure change uh, over time in particular places. And ultimately our objective is to have a system that will be accessible to a wide variety of users in communities really throughout the United States. There are three key dimensions to the set of indicators and we're looking in three broad areas uh, to define vibrancy. And we define vibrancy as the people who are in a place, the character number and characteristics of those people, um, the level of activity and the kinds of activities that occur in places. And then finally, and as an economist I have to say, if we improve the vibrancy of a place, we increase its value in a market and an economic sense. So ultimately we think vibrancy will show up in changes in property values uh, in particular places as they become more vibrant. So people, activity, and value are the three broad areas in which we're constructing indicators. Now we face, and I appreciate I'm being a little bit wonky here, but uh, we're digging into a lot of different sources of data. And we have data from various sources at various levels of geographic resolution. And we're trying to pull them together in a way that we can analyze specific communities. So while we get data from the census, from business records, from cell phone records, and from other sources, we're trying to develop sort of a congruent basis for combining them. And I'll show you what, how that works in terms of three specific examples of the indicators that we are developing uh, for ArtPlace. And I'll start with one of our people indicators, uh, which is a measure we're calling creative professionals, which is borrowed from sort of the analysis of creative class that Rich Florida and others have done. But we're looking for people in specific occupations that we think uh, are signals of, of vibrancy in a community. And our belief is that vibrant places have lots of creative workers in them. And this particular measure is looking at not specifically this image where creative workers are busily working necessarily, but actually the neighborhoods in which they live. So what we've done is, sorry, I clicked through two slides there. This is our definition. We look at artists, designers, engineers, architects, and a series of media and, uh, and entertainment related um, occupations. These data are taken from the American Community Survey. Uh, these are the specific categories. It's about five million workers nationally fall into those categories. And importantly, it includes about 750,000 people who are self-employed, uh, typically as artists, designers, writers, and others in this field. So we're looking at where these people live. So, sorry, try to advance here. This is a map, and I'll, I'll be using San Francisco for the most part because this is where we're piloting some of this data. This is a map color-coded in basically responding to sort of the, the intensity corresponds to the color here, relative heat. Uh, the red colors have the highest concentrations of creative professionals. The cooler and blue colors have the lowest concentrations. If it's white, it means it didn't even uh, get above a minimum threshold. But you see, can see here in San Francisco, in downtown, and some areas in the East Bay and up in Marin County, there are high concentrations of creative professionals. And elsewhere in suburban areas and outlying areas, much lower concentrations of creative <laughs> professionals. And what we'll be doing in the meeting that, that was mentioned earlier tomorrow is essentially ground truthing this and about nine other indicators with people who are expert in these areas to say whether uh, the indicator that we've chosen corresponds in any systematic way to what their on the ground perceptions are about the most vibrant neighborhoods. And then ultimately by layering all of these different indicators together, we'll come up with a picture of the places that seem to be the most vibrant uh, and, and are consistently illustrated. 
Uh, this is a map of New York. I'm, we, don't have, we don't have the entire metropolitan area here, but hopefully that corresponds to some of your intuitive notions about where some of the most vibrant neighborhoods are. And again, this is just a first step in the screening process. And we can set our threshold, which is the red areas are now at least 10% creative professionals. We can raise that up. Uh, and, uh, and, and uh, focus in on e even more so. But you see clearly here in Manhattan in, uh, and in Brooklyn, pretty big concentrations in the outlying boroughs, much less so. A second indicator that we have is something that we're calling indicator businesses. And essentially, these are the kinds of businesses that people would go to as destinations. Uh, to uh, obtain a service, to participate in a social experience, uh, to interrelate to other people, to buy goods and services. And so, for example, bookstores would be an, an indicator kind of a business. It's a destination that attracts people. Um, the data that we're gathering here, we essentially have a universe of all of the businesses in the United States classified uh, by the kind of thing that they do. And we know specifically, obviously, where they're located. And we're focusing on about 45 different uh, types of businesses. Um, and they tend to be in the retail, service, food service, uh, personal service categories. And we know where these uh, businesses are located. So when we map them, and well, this is a complete list of all of them, uh, you get the general idea of the kind of thing that we're looking at. When we map them in the San Francisco Bay Area, they look something like this. Now that just really corresponds overall to where the concentrations of businesses are. So what we do is begin sort of refining that data and zooming into particular areas. The first thing we do is overlay a grid on top of the metropolitan area and essentially knock out all the grid cells where there isn't at least one of these indicator businesses. And that be then begins to tell you about something about the structure, the urban structure of the San Francisco metropolitan area. And then we highlight cells that meet a minimum threshold of about 100 businesses per square mile. Uh, we have the, the metropolitan area divided up into half mile, 800 meter squares here. And focus in on those squares, and that begins to give us, again, candidate neighborhoods of where we need to be looking. And this is that same map applied to uh, the uh, New York metropolitan area. Again, very high concentrations in some places and much lower concentrations elsewhere. We'd probably want, because of New York's density, want to set the threshold somewhat higher than we have here. But that's one of the things that we're experimenting with. The final thing I'd like to talk about in our activity indicators is cell phone data. And everybody in this room probably has a little device. They may not have a signal in this room. Uh, but it is constantly communicating with the network. And the network is aware of essentially how many people there are, a raw count of people, in every cell. And the cells are 100 meter by 100 meter, so very fine resolution. And we use that data to track levels of activity in particular places. And our belief is, this indicator, uh, is based on the assumption that, t that people, the vibrant areas attract people all hours of the day and night. And specifically, we focus on nights and weekends. So um, this data is drawn from a, an aggregator called SpotRank, which ga gets data from a number of cell phone companies throughout the, company, or throughout the country. So it's a geographically representative sample. And my colleague, uh, Dylan Mahmoudi, has done a superb job of collating that data and producing specific information, I'll just highlight that what we're doing is looking at an entire uh, weekly period and 24 hours a day. So 24 by 7 gives you 168 observations on the level of activity in any of these 100 meter cells on an average day. Uh, and what we're focusing on is really this red period here at the bottom, evenings and weekends, after 6 o'clock and before midnight on weekdays, and then during most waking hours uh, on weekends, 9 a.m. to midnight. Uh, and saying, where is the greatest level of activity in a metropolitan area uh, in, uh, in, uh, in specific places? And so what we've done is mapped that. And this is the map for the San Francisco Bay Area. The red areas, again, accord with the greatest intensity of activity, the yellow somewhat less, the blue uh, the lowest levels of activity, and white means nothing is going on there. But corresponds immediately to kind of your sense of, of where things are happening in the San Francisco Bay Area. And that contrasts very dramatically with Detroit. So I'll just go back and forth here. That is San Francisco. 
nights and weekends. This is Detroit nights and weekends. There's a little bit of activity, but it's just not at the scale, at the intensity that you find scattered really throughout San Francisco metropolitan area. And again, the purpose of this is not, not to downplay Detroit or uh, to praise San Francisco, oh, San Francisco, but to say we can zoom into any of these particular 100 meter cells and over a period of time measure the degree of change in those cells to know whether vibrancy is increasing, which is really what we're all about in this process. And then we can zoom into particular places. This is Berkeley and highlight down to the, almost the block level uh, whether, whether an area is active or not and measure whether it's changing over time. And then we're, we can condense that information into these, hundred, or into these uh, 800 meter cells, these half mile cells, to know where the hot spots are in an area and where the cool spots are in an area. And just to round out the list of indicators, I've given you sort of a brief teaser of three of the indicators that we've developed, three of the most interesting ones. But we're trying to develop a, a suite, uh, and these are the 10 candidate indicators that we have right now. The people indicators that we have, population density, the employment rate, which is how many, what fraction of the population is employed, creative professionals, which I showed you. Then we're looking at the density of jobs in an area, whether an area is mixed use, whether it is a combination of both residential and non-residential uses, the cell indicators that you saw, the level of street connectivity, how well the street network works, these indicator businesses, independent businesses, so we're separating businesses into chain and non-chain businesses. We think that's a potential indicator. And then we're counting the number of jobs in the creative industry. And out of those and some additional data that we'll gather on value, we will construct the vibrancy index that we're focusing on. And I guess that means I'm done. So I'll thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe. And joining Carol and Joe for our discussion um, are uh, Kimberly Driggins, you guys can all come up, Associate Director for Citywide Planning for Washington, D.C., who is responsible for managing citywide planning projects across several areas, including housing, economic development, schools, transportation, and capital improvement planning. Welcome, Kimberly. Sue Mosley, President of Midtown Detroit, Inc., who led Midtown Detroit's work on parks, pre-development loans, and financing for the Inn on Ferry Street and other real estate developments in the city for years. More recently, Sue and her organization has been working to bring 15,000 young people to live, work, and play in downtown Detroit by 2015. And Kevin Stolarik, Research Director at the Martin Prosperity Institute in the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. Kevin has provided quantitative research and analytical support for urban theorist Richard Florida. Kevin continues to actively collaborate with Richard and other researchers and has a particular interest in measuring the impacts of arts and culture investments in neighborhoods. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Thank you. Oh, oh, my God. Okay. Hello. I've got a loud voice, but this probably will help. Um, let's talk about how we're going to run this panel so that um, you'll know. Um, about We're going to talk here for 30, 40 minutes and then get you into the conversation. There are people who will be traveling up and down the aisles with index cards. If you have a question, please write it down on one of those cards and it will be delivered up to us. Let me say one thing for those of you, I know some of you, and I'm so glad you showed up, uh, some of you have been uh, active uh, uh, inquirers about Art Place and uh, the grants and loans that we make. I do want to point out that I have two of my colleagues here tonight, Bridget Marquis, our program director, sitting up front and Tim Halber, uh, our communication director. And if you have specific questions about the Art Place grant making process. I'm going to ask you not to submit a question here, but uh, to talk to any of us afterwards uh, during the reception. We'll be here and we're happy to talk with you about those, take cards, whatever um, you want to do. So just want to mention uh, 
mention that. So hold on to those cards and those questions, and then we're going to ask others because we have a great panel. And I will start with Sue. Sue has been at this work a long time. And I love the fact, Sue, that you have a, uh, you know, you're measuring your own efforts against a very specific and very tough and challenging goal, the 15 by 15, right? So you're still there. 15,000 uh, college educated people in Midtown uh, and Midtown Detroit mm -hmm. uh, by 2015. So it's, it's, it's really clear what Sue is trying to accomplish. And um, just for those of us who don't know Midtown Detroit, describe it. Uh, well, it's an area that's just north of the uh, downtown. So in that, in that uh, uh, map that was highlighted, it's that area where you did see those red cells. Um, it's the area that has a major medical, two ma major medical campuses, the Urban University and all of the major cultural institutions. So it's where a lot of the legacy assets reside in Detroit, up a major corridor. I'm going to show a few yeah. slides, some of the work we're doing in Detroit. Um, as Carol said, and it's no surprise to anyone, uh, you know, Detroit continues to be a very challenged, um, you know, area uh, for a lot of different reasons, but um, many of the foundations, uh, national and local foundations, as well as a lot of the leadership from our anchor institutions have decided that uh, they really want to align investment and drive uh, talent back to this part of the city. So with that, uh, we're doing a lot of things. There's lots of uh, emphasis that's being put on creating a lot more community-driven uh, social investments in small business development in Detroit. Uh, this is happening all over that uh, core greater downtown area in all of the different districts uh, where lots of funding sources have been made available, lots of technical assistance uh, for folks who are really looking to do quite frankly, more than usually just open a business. They're hiring local folks, they're doing lots of social engagement, uh, they're you know, creating uh, um, lots of um, opportunities for interaction and co-working, um, and this is really attracting a lot of young folks to Detroit. Uh, that and then, of course, the values in Detroit, where uh, relative to lots of other cities like New York or other major cities, what you can pay to rent a place in Detroit is significantly uh, lower. Uh, this is one of the developments that we're building right now um, that is going to be mixed, uh, mixed use with lots of studio and one bedroom specifically for young professionals and lots of independent businesses that we are already signed up for 11 uh, commercial spaces in this building. So this is right near the campus. Uh, our major urban campus uh, that has about 32,000 students, many of which do not live in the city of Detroit. So part of the market that we're going after is clearly this market. Uh, there's also those placemaking activities that we're very involved in, creating all sorts of trails through the neighborhood that just reduce the size of the lanes of uh, vehicle traffic and give up more space for pedestrians and bicyclists. Uh, this is gonna be a network of about 10 miles that goes all along our riverfront out through this corridor. Um, and it's uh, heavily funded through a regional greenways initiative. So uh, open space, that sort of thing. And then we're working on a two block arts district. This is a $60 million real estate development that we're doing with a couple of other uh, nonprofit and a couple of for-profit partners. Uh, this is uh, over a number of years, but we've taken a lot of these vacant buildings in the district um, and sort of retooled them. This is uh, artist housing, uh, 10 creative businesses, and a actual clay studio with Puavic Pottery uh, for education classes. They're all combined now in this formerly pretty desolate block of property. Uh, and then we worked with a private gallery owner uh, to retool a former vacant collision shop into a beautiful gallery and are adding lots of walkways and green spaces throughout this entire district, again, to attract uh, folks who want to be in this space. Uh, lots of other uses, uh, restaurant, cafes, and other arts-related uses are also being combined here. So that's the kinds of activity. The other thing that we, uh, we are doing is we were fortunate to um, uh, raise uh, $10 million between our anchor institutions and our downtown employers to actually incentivize people to move to that corridor. So lots of the corporations that are moving down, thousands and thousands of people uh, into the downtown core, which is a significant trend happen happening in Detroit due to some of our civic leadership. Uh, all of those folks now have significant in incentives to move to that core 
and many, many, many people are taking advantage, and that's part of how we're going to hit this, uh, this mark of, of uh, 15,000 uh, young, talented folks. Great. Uh, just so we know who we're talking to, how many of you are artists or associated with arts organizations? Okay, great. Um, so, Sue, I, I think those of us who, you know, who are doing, trying to do this work of creative placemaking alongside you, I, one of the ways I think about this is, you know, when a mayor needs to think about rejuvenating uh, a neighborhood, Kimberly, you're in the same business, and in, in DC, and you know, you look in your bag of, you know, you, you look in your bag of tricks and you say, what's in there that I can use to get momentum underway in a, in a neighborhood that's, that needs it? And I think most of the people in this room would say, well, I want the mayor to pull out you know, the arts, right? That's, that's the tool and the toolkit I want them to use. So you're sort of the mayor of Midtown, Detroit. Um, what gives your efforts the biggest lift? I mean, what are the characteristics of investments being made in Midtown Detroit that you think have the greatest leverage for that 15 by 15? Well, we're in sort of a unique position where we are really actually short of residential project product in the neighborhood. So just a, a real core basic need is just quality and all different types of residential um, for all the different markets that we are attracting to that corridor. So first and foremost, and then secondly, I think is just all of this you know, entrepreneurial activity. And it isn't all just retail shops or coffee houses. There's a, really a resurgence even of uh, small independent manufacturing going on around the neighborhood uh, of all kinds of interesting products by philanthropists and by uh, startup companies, you know, a wide range of people who really want to be in, involved in just trying to rebuild a very important legacy city. So all of those investments, I think, together, both, the, both that commercial and residential together is what's going to ultimately you know, create the density we need uh, then for a lot of other things to follow. Currently, we're only in our corridor here about 13 people per acre. And we really need to get to at least 20. So part, again, of that reason why the focus is always attracting folks, attracting folks that, that have uh, also some, um, not only talented folks, but folks that have uh, some income to spend and help drive other new endeavors in the neighborhood is just critical to a, to a really disinvested city like Detroit. So you mentioned housing. You mentioned mm -hmm. the entrepreneurial activity, mm -hmm. including manufacturing. Where do the arts fit? Um, the arts are also a critical piece. A lot of the arts that we're seeing in our neighborhood, besides just galleries, we have about 14 uh, nonprofit and private galleries in the neighborhood and all the major uh, cultural institutions. Part of it is because the arts and the major museums are all sort of retooling their, you know, their uh, way of sort of engaging uh, with the neighborhood and the city. Um, all of them have faced tremendous financial challenges, so everyone is looking for, you know, there's a new demographic moving in, there's more going on in this neighborhood, how are we going to attract actual residents to become regular users of our institutions? So all of them are working on strategies for doing that. Um, and then I think there's a whole bunch of folks that are just moving to the city, um, uh, many of them artists. Um, and part of that is driven by the fact that you know, there are low values, there's lots of canvas, canvases of all types uh, that artists can use in the city of Detroit, whether it's interesting industrial buildings, whether it's uh, um, uh, public spaces, uh, vacant land for repurposing. So that's another important activity that just goes on all day long in Detroit, um, many times underground, many times all uh, different types of neighborhoods, uh, but clearly it's another underpinning, I think, of what you see in the greater downtown area. What, for you, Sue, what separates a, a, a good arts investment from a better arts investment? Um, well, I think, number one, if you have lots of partners, that's always good. You're doing multiple activities. Um, I think that that gives you a much better um, investment and leverage. Um, I think that if you are um, you know, attracting a variety of audiences, which gets back to that diversity uh, question, um, you know, I think all of those things really are uh, what's, what's needed as opposed to just a one-off arts investment. I mean, there's important, um, uh, you know, at certain times for very challenged uh, institutions, 
you understand where some of that is important. But if you really want from a community development perspective to get a lot more bang for your buck, I think you're looking for those kinds of uh, um, uh, activities that have more social engagement, have more uh, involvement by the community, oftentimes they're more socially driven, um, maybe more meaningful to a broader set of the public, um, and then you're really getting more traction, really built sort of from the ground up that carries over, I think, into um, a lot of other dynamics that uh, can uh, bring more funding, uh, bring more media, um, and just bring other, you know, young, talented, and um, uh, uh, creative types to your city. Kimberly, I, I want to ask you the same question, but first I want to give you a chance to show us what you did at uh, Lumen 8? Lumen 8. Anacostia. Anacostia. Yeah, great. so do you have some slides? I do. I okay, do. great. Kimberly Driggins with the Office of Planning in D.C. Great, thank you. Um, we are, as Carol mentioned, uh, we're one of the first, um, we were one of the first round grant recipients for the um, Art Place project. We're working in four neighborhoods. Um, the, I'm gonna talk about Luminate Anacostia today. That's the first um, project that we've launched, um, but we are, are doing, we're doing work in four areas. We partnered with Arch Development Corporation, which is similar to Sue's organization. They're a nonprofit, they're a 20 year old nonprofit um, organization that's sole mission is to really promote um, revitalization through the arts and the creative economy. Our, our grant is to do these arts and culture temporiums. We're working in four neighborhoods, Anacostia, Deanwood, Brookland, and Central 14th Street. Each neighborhood is gonna receive about a minimum of 75,000 each. That's the grant plus some monies that Office of Planning kicked in as well as our partners, DC Arts and Humanities Commission. ARCH, as I said, is our, our project partner on the ground in the Anacostia neighborhood. They own a number of galleries. And for folks who are not familiar with the, the district, where Anacostia is, it's in Ward 8. And it's, it's physically separated from the rest of the city by the river, by the Anacostia River. And Ward 7 and 8, also known as East of the River, um, has had years or decades of disinvestment in the area, and those areas are struggling to revitalize. What's happening over in East of the River right now is there's about $800 million of investment going on with respect to housing, job creation, and um, some of the arts as well. We have the largest development project in the country, the St. Elizabeth's Rede Redevelopment Project, happening in Ward 8. So this really is a, a catalytic time for the, for the area, for the neighborhood, and really for that area of the city. Luminate Anacostia, we, la we launched it uh, two weeks, a week ago, uh, April 14th, in, in the heart of historic Anacostia. Um, I'll, I'll have a slide next that kind of shows where we are, but um, we, we uh, took over about half a dozen vacant storefronts. What you're seeing here is the warehouse. This is about 240,000 square feet of vacant space. This was actually um, the, our old police evidence warehouse, and it was sitting empty, vacant, and you know, artists typically like these types of raw spaces. So we thought that we could activate this space with a number of projects, both performance as well as creative arts. The Luminate Anacostia idea, it's really patterned after the Nuit Blanche or White Night Festival that's held in Paris and Toronto every year. Um, the, the illumination of the area of the, of the, of the streets and really of the neighborhood um, really represents sort of um, the dawn of a new beginning. And this name, it was, it, it, branding is so important. Luminate Anacostia, we, we developed and conceived this and there was a Twitter, there was a Facebook. I mean, long before the project actually launched, there was a lot of media buzz about this. It, the press on this has been pretty unprecedented for a temporary public art project. Um, and we want to stress temporary. In DC, we don't do temporary that well. So we want to, 
um, land, land, land owners are a little um, sheepish about lending their properties. So we're very clear here that our duration is three to six months, um, a minimum of three months, a maximum of six months in the community. Um, what you're seeing for, so for the festival, it, that was a one night um, launch and then the actual pop-up temporium shops or retail creative shops are gonna remain in the community. The, the project area is uh, MLK is the heart of the Anacostia community along with Good Hope Road. Arch Development owns a number of the properties. I lost the clicker, here we go. Um, right here they have a training business center. They own Blank Space Studio, which is given out to artists to show their works, as well as the police evidence warehouse. So there's a really good footprint here, and it's got great bones in terms of what's available. And so in terms of the size and scale, we were able to do something fairly unique. I'm not sure how it's going to look in the other three neighborhoods that we're working in, but for Anacostia, there was really the perfect storm in terms of vacant properties available, in terms of an uh, incredibly strong partner in Arch Development Corporation, and uh, a thriving um, arti ar artist community in the neighborhood. I want to stress that 50% of the artists that are participating in the Luminate um, project are east of the river. So the monies are, you know, for the artists and they are, I would even up that, we're, we're being conservative there, I would say about 70, 75% of the artists are actually east of the river in Ward 8. So it's incredible. This is our, our kickoff. This is our, our mayor, Mayor Gray in the middle. Oops. Um, oops. Mayor Gray, Councilmember Barry, and Arch um, Dwayne Gauthier on the on, on the left right there. Um, we, in the warehouse, there was a temporary flea market. Also this um, amazing art installation. So I mentioned earlier that we partnered with Arts and Humanities Commission. They're actually doing a concurrent temporary public art installation called Five by Five. This is one of the projects. This artist is actually from the Oakland area, Monica Canalau, and this project was uh, all repurposed and recycled materials, and she collected it sort of on along the way to Washington, D.C. It occupies the entire fourth floor of the warehouse and the roof, and it was really just a magnificent um, structure. We activated the street space. This is just a shot of the big chair. It's an iconic landmark in Anacostia, a meeting place. It's actually not very active during the weekend. Like There's a lot of foot traffic during the day. There's a lot of work during the day because there's some government buildings there. But on the weekends, the historic corridor actually is quite, um, it's quite um, dull, it's not much going on. So this day we had people out, walking dogs, just sitting. This is the illumination part at night. It's the big chair. Businesses, um, they had record setting days um, on, on, the, on the opening weekend. Mama's Kitchen, which is a relatively new business that opened up, they had their best day of business as did four or five other businesses in the area. It's a pizza shop but we promoted it. There was marketing with not just the um, Luminate art projects and artists, but also the local businesses that were in and around. And when people came off the metro, our subway system, when people came in to check in points, they received a map and a grid of the local businesses to patronize as well as while they were looking at the art. Again, we activated the street. This is right by the gallery, and there's a local radio station, WEAC Radio. This is at night. This is Art Studios. There's about 20 or so exhibits in this one space alone. different types of art from performance to actual um, media and print media as well as spoken word. It was, a, it was a wonderful potpourri of offerings here.
one of the galleries at night, you can see that there's still a lot of activity. Typically, that's not the case. Usually, the streets are, are, are vacant. That's an alley that we, we lit up as well. Staff from Arch. So I just wanted to give you, to talk about Luminate is to really see what's happening there. We're continuing to use the space, and we've been partnering with international as well as local organizations, um, folks who have never been to Anacostia and those who have been in the community to really create a dynamic project. Thanks, Kimberly. <laughs> Kimberly, um, I was, Leo, where are you? I saw, Leo, there he is. I was with Leo uh, in Newark uh, a couple of weeks ago and, and Cory Booker uh, was sitting next to me and I slipped him a note. And I said, what remains your biggest challenge as mayor? And he looked at it and he, you know, <sighs> laughed and then, he, this was before he ran into the burning building. He laughed <laughs> and then he, you know, he, he did this <sighs> big sigh and he leaned over to me and he said, getting people to believe that things can be different. And it struck me that, you know, yeah. the temporium, right? I mean, Sue, you deal with this every day. It's like, how do you fake it till you make it? How do you, how do you get people to believe that there's a different future for this place? And it seems to me that art has, it sort of punches way above its weight when it comes to getting people to believe that this place can be different. And I'm curious, I mean, is, was that the intent of the temporium? I mean, I think that, you know, if, when I think about it, that, that definitely was sort of the underlying principle of it. I mean, you know, the area has had so much disinvestment and there have been efforts and, you know, there's organizations there, but this, this project seemed to galvanize the community from the actual artists to the businesses to the political leadership um, in a way that um, no other project down there recently, and I, again, there's major development projects, there's affordable housing projects, but art is so accessible, and it's, it's really, um, it's an it's a easy way to have a conversation. People want to talk about what they're doing, what they like, or if they're a creative, what they're doing. So I found that the, there's a commonality in, in the arts community that really brought a lot of different um, sections of the community together. People were meeting one another that they hadn't known or really, quite frankly, just didn't associate with for whatever reasons um, in the community. So, yeah, and, and repeatedly, you know, what I hear is that, you know, from the Ward 8 um, residents, the political leadership, the ANCs, which is a local, a very local sort of po political position that, you know, it's, it's, this is so important here. You know, thank you for choosing our neighborhood here. Like, you know, people don't know what we have here. So it's really installing a sense of pride mm -hmm. that, you know, I'm not gonna say it wasn't there, but it's definitely elevated their, their chest is out a little bit more because of this. And, and we talk a lot on our staff at Art Place about intensity, right? The need to create intensity, and that's what, Joe, you're looking at, but also constancy, right? So, so you, do, you have the intensity of the opening event, but then how do, you, how do you achieve constancy so that people, they don't just have one record day, but they build on that? Yeah, that's really what we're, we're really um, trying to figure that out. I mean, the last weekend, so, it started April 14th. We had a pretty big event called Cherry Blast, which was um, connected to the Cherry Blossom Festival. Mm -hmm. So we were lucky enough to snag that, it was really a rave party, in that um, evidence warehouse. <laughs> and so, you know, that actually brought a lot of people, more people that weren't there the first weekend to that, to party. And we had the galleries stay open um, longer and the businesses stay open longer. So we feel that um, strong programming to assist the galleries and the um, artwork is really key. Whether it's a performance, whether it's a party, um, that we want to have a big um, event every month um, there and do a closing to kind of drive people there. And the website and the marketing, I mean, the website is, is pretty dynamic. It's up to date. There are photos. All the photos that I showed you there are up on the website. So publicity and buzz also, you know, have you checked this out? And the artists themselves, I mean, the artists are really the story. And some of them have done work in Baltimore and Philadelphia, but they're getting more traction, um, more hits for their work in this Luminate project than they have in other places. And those are the stories we want to capture. Yeah. I think it's very interesting to note that Kimberly is with the Office of Planning. 
in DC, <laughs> not the Office of Cultural Development or anything else, which I think is very interesting. Uh, when, um, you know, as you, as you think about this work that you've done, there, the, when we do our work, right, one of the concerns people have, and understandably, is, oh, but you're talking about redevelopment, so that's, at what point does that become gentrification? At what point does redevelopment that you sought then becomes a negative thing? How are you thinking about that in, in your work in Anacostia and in these three other neighborhoods? Well, I, I am with the Office of Planning, and, and really the, the context is our small area planning work, and we also did this um, creative DC action agenda. So the work that we're doing is actually based, um, it's rooted in our planning work. And I think that that's really important because, you know, really, you know, our director, Harriet Tregoni, who, who will be here tomorrow, she's really about implementation. So this project is you know, moving the dial on our implementation efforts and, you know, to plan not just to have a nice plan and to put it on the shelf, but to actually, you know, roll up your sleeves and do the low hanging fruit and, and go for it, you know, immediately, even before a plan is passed. So that's the context. With respect to the gentrification issue, we're, we're, we are working on multiple fronts. I think, as I said earlier, the arts conversation, it, it's an easier conversation to have. I mean, the gentrification issues are definitely prevalent. I'd say in Anacostia, you know, it, it hasn't, um, that's not the conversation right now. Um, I think with all of this um, attention and the investment, you know, we're looking at um, affordable housing strategies to make sure that people can stay in place. And some of the other neighborhoods that we're working in, gentrification is definitely the, the number one issue. And we're hoping to use this arts project as a way to help with that conversation. Really, to help with the conversation. Yeah. You don't think you'll get a backlash from that, that in investment? Um, well, you know, the community, <laughs> you can't please everyone. I mean, I do think that the conversation, really? I think, <laughs> Kimberly, <laughs> come on. I think it's going to help the conversation. Um, I mean, really, I think in all the communities that we're working in, um, there's been a dearth of cultural offerings and sort of a focus on that. So people are actually kind of tired about, you know, I'm not going to say that the issues aren't as um, relevant, but they're a little exhausted about housing. And you know, I just find that this is a way to have the conversation in a different manner. Um, not to say that people aren't concerned about you know, their rising property values or businesses, but you know, using the arts, I mean, that's, it's an easier conversation. And people see the upside of that immediately. You know, arts and cultural programming, it's an immediate thing that you can see and touch and feel which it's not a project that's five years down the line. So I think that that actually helps. Uh, if we have time, I want you to come back and tell the story about the different generations oh. and, the way, and the, the, some of the challenges you ran into. But I want to turn to Kevin, because I think you've got a, a, you are in a position to give us advice. And I, I want to I, I get it from you, because you were with Richard, responsible for re-energizing the conversation around the value of creative people, the people in this room. Um, how do you measure the contributions that artists, that a, a, a segment of the creative class, as you guys defined it, uh, the, measure the value that they contribute to communities? Very, very carefully. <laughs> okay, um, and? Well, I, mean, I got mine too, right? So, since, since, you know, this is just totally um, extemporaneous and we all have slides. Um, so, uh, the, the first off, I, I should have slides, there we go. Um, the first thing I, though, I, I feel I have to do, and, and, it, and it, in terms of addressing this, but also kind of the audience, um, I, I always feel like, especially when I'm in a room that's predominantly full of artists, that I need to be apologizing. Um, I've been working with Richard Florida for over 12 years. So I started working with Richard actually. I, I, was, I met Richard at the point in time when he had cashed his advance check from Basic Books, which was his publisher for Rise of the Creative Class, when it was a very, very small advance check. But he still realized he actually had to write a book. Um, <clears throat> and that was the point really when we, when we met. And, and one of the things, and the reason why I always feel like I have to apologize is because 
for the longest time there has been this question, and I think Carol worded it quite well, and, and Joe's alluded to it. Uh, I've met with, I can't tell you how many mayors and counselors and governors and others, oh yeah, you work with that Florida guy. Yeah, 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 I read the book, or I had someone read it for me and I read the summary. And, and I got it, right? All we need to do is we get, get ourselves some gays and some artists and a Starbucks and a bike path or two, and it's gonna solve all of our problems. And they're out there, I'm sorry, and they are, they are out there. They're, they're, they've been elected, people have voted for them. People are voting for them again. Um, so, which is never the argument that we made, right? Uh, um, but, but, so I always, but what's interesting though as well, was it, it became, and I, I did a, uh, actually an event for the Canadian Association of Artists, and I said, you know, the problem is it's a trap. And, and the reason is because when times were good, it was really easy for counselors and mayors and funders to say, you know what, we've got you know, this Florida guy, he's a smart academic, and he said the arts matter, we believe him. So we're gonna give you funding. And now when times are not so good, the interesting thing is they're all still saying, yes, we still believe you, but we need you to prove it. And that's been the challenge. Right? Because, and, and, and for many, from a, for a bunch of reasons, I think, I mean, I think what Joe is talking about in terms of kind of vibrancy, right, even, in fact, even right, vibrancy before value, I think is an even important way of looking at that. But because the challenge is, the things that you really do have to look at, let's see, this is just really slow, okay, right, you need to understand if you're trying to measure the impact, and you're trying to understand what the impact is that arts is having, you first need to figure out on what. What are we talking about here? When we say we're having, we're having impact, a cultural impact? Is it economic? Is it social? What about environmental and sustainability? Right? And we, we've got a phenomenal installation in Anacostia that was built by foul materials as the woman traveled across country from Oakland to Washington, DC. Right? So there's tremendous things that are happening in all four of these areas. Um, Tim Jones, who runs Artscape in Toronto, likes to call it his quadruple bottom line. <laughs> it's, that you actually need to think about all four of these things. That when it comes to understanding, when you're talking about impact, well, where? What, what are we really looking for? The second thing is, what are the kinds of things that can influence the impact that we're looking for? Right? So, true professor, professor of style, I have a slide full of text. But the key point is that there's all kinds of different things that influence the kinds of relationships that you have. So am I talking about individuals? Am I talking about organizations? What, you know, when we talk about it, who's having this impact and what are the kind of characteristics of them? And, and who, you know, what are we really talking about in terms of some of the things that we know? And all of these things matter, right? In terms of the kind of impact and what happens and what's going on. And then finally, where? So we're saying, okay, great, it's impact, and we have these areas, but where are we actually having the impact? Because the thing is, right, investment in arts and culture, in creative placemaking, and the things that you're doing, yes, it can change neighborhoods, but it can also change the world. Bill Bao is the example that everybody always loves to use, right? Well, Bill Bao has changed the world. One little Guggenheim Museum, a little bit of Frank Gehry, and look at what happens. <laughs> But the impact that can, or, or Nuit Blanche is another ph phenomenal example, right? Paris said, hey, we want to do an all-night arts festival, and Toronto quickly copied it, and now the rest of the world is copying that. So the kind of impact and the places where you can have that impact vary all the way across the board, from the neighborhood level all the way up to, to around the entire planet. And so when it comes to understanding the impact of arts and culture, Right? It's like, well, wait a minute, what are we talking about? What kind of impact is it? Who's having that impact and where are they having it? And those are really some of the key things I think that you have to think about because, as I said, it's really tough to do. It's important and we know the value is there and we know it's still being created, but you have to be able to find it and you have to be able to identify it because people are asking for it now, right? They're saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, we, we said you had value, we believed you. But now we, need, we actually need the proof, right? And I need more than just Richard Florida's next book in order to be able to do that, unfortunately. So there. Thank you, Kevin. You know, I, I, I think those are, it, I, I appreciate the setup there. Um, but, but let me ask you, given, you know, you've been, as you know, you, you've been in the field, you've heard these arguments that have been made with mayors, you know when they've been successful, 
you know, when they haven't. Um, still today, what do you think is the most persuasive argument uh, on behalf of the arts with those who are, I'll call them non-believers? Cirque du Soleil. Cirque du Soleil, tell well, me more. Well, well, and the reason I say Cirque, we did a bunch of, we actually did a bunch of work in Montreal. The culture of Montreal, and this is one of those, that pulls in so many other stories because what happened was culture of Montreal said, hey, we want you guys to come and look at what's going on in the city and help us understand the relationship between arts, culture, and technology, and the two-way flows. How, in fact, Arts and culture is influencing technology in the city and how technology is influencing arts and culture. We, wanna, we really want to understand that. And, and in Culture Montreal, I had to go off and get, get actually to put together a funding team that was like 15 different regional, provincial, federal organizations you know, and, and some in, you know, local businesses and stuff just to be able to kind of get all the, all the pieces in place. And it was the first time most of these people had ever met, which was really, which what in itself was interesting. Um, and we started looking at Montreal, right? And I would say the most innovative place in Montreal, um, by far, is actually Bombardier. They make aircraft, um, and they do it very well. But the second most innovative place is Cirque du Soleil. And, and, the re and Cirque was started, I mean, Guy de Liberté was a street performer and a fire eater. That's what he did. I mean, he, and, and, and still, that's basically, that's still what Cirque does, right? I mean, it's still street performance. Um, but they're incredibly innovative and they're incredibly technical. Um, they hire more cobblers than any other business on the face of the planet. They bring in people. I actually met a guy in the airport in Montreal who comes, a oh, little old guy from northern Italy, who was coming over to Montreal to make shoes, right? Because it turns out, right, all of their costumes and everything they do, they, they change performers about every three months. Well, every costume has a set of shoes. Every, the shoe has to be custom made to each performer. They're constantly changing performers. They need a lot of cobblers. Um, so, but so this guy from Italy who actually comes over for three months and then goes home for one month and then comes back for three months and, and makes shoes for Cirque du Soleil. And people never think about that, right? That, you know, wait, they're a circus. Why do they need shoemakers? Um, but it's this, it's this interaction of, of technology and creativity and the way that those things flow and the way that they fit together that I think is the real strong argument. One of the things that's really interesting is, is from both Detroit and DC, one of the things we heard about was businesses and small businesses and entrepreneurship. And artists are entrepreneurial, no doubt. But also, right, they're influencing and they're impacting what's going on with digital media and with other things, right? They never do just, they never have just one job. They always have 15, right? And, and, and one of those jobs may very well be working for God forbid, an advertising firm or a design firm. Or, but, but those interactions are constantly happening. Um, I said a long time ago, when, when uh, Rise First came out, we did an event, and I said, you know, you're never going to be able to organize the creative class. But what you can do is connect them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's the connectivity that really pays off. And, it's, and if you don't have it there, you can't connect it. And so that's really, I think, the argument that really, I think, holds the most water is yes, it has its own value and it's important and, and you need to have this, but it's, it's also the impact and the influence. And you don't know where it's gonna happen. You can't predict it, you can't control it, but unless you, know, unless you have those ingredients in the pot, you're not gonna get stew. And if you were, um, oops, if you were a mayor, uh, switch sides, uh, <coughs> what would you be investing in? I mean, in terms of the arts, is there, again, I'll ask this, is there something better than good? What, what's better than good? Um, I, th I think the, it depends on where I'm mayor, I think. Okay. If I were mayor of Toronto, yep. which thank God I'm not Rob Ford, for those of you who know him, but. Um, <laughs> but You'd be killing transit. I know, even and, tonight, I, and right? I wouldn't be going to gay pride either. Um, but no, but in a, in some, in a place like Toronto, one of the things for Toronto that's incredibly powerful is diversity. New York is the same way, right? And, and, and so the, the investment there is, is in local arts, right? The, it's, it's actually in understanding, it's the communities and the, and the immigrant communities and the, uh, all of the interesting things that are happening. Not, not the, it's not the big arts. It's not, uh, my, my friend Kirk Watson, the former mayor of Austin, used to call it the SOBs. He said, yeah, Austin, we don't have the SOBs here meaning the symphony, the opera, the ballet, right? But they're the ones who suck up all the funding, right? Um, and Austin doesn't have them. You know, instead, Austin has what, well, I love the way, the way Kirk put it. He called it the street corner strange, 
which is true about Austin, Texas, right? But that's, it's, it's funding the street corner strange. It's funding, it's the small things that, you know, I said, the, the one thing always about any kind of creative economy endeavor, I always say, uh, what you have to do, right, is it, it takes a shotgun and not a rifle. Meaning, I know it's a horribly violent metaphor, but it works so beautifully because a shotgun throws out 100 BBs. Rifles depend on silver bullets. And there are so many development efforts that have been done that all it is is a silver bullet. Oh, we're going to add a convention center. We're going to expand our airport. We're going to put in a new transit system, and that's going to solve all of our problems. It's going to get us some gays, artists, bikes, and Starbucks, right? Bike paths and Starbucks, and we'll be OK. But those silver bullet ideas, and that what, what it really takes is it takes 100 little things. And you got to shoot up, you know, you get 100 little things out there. So a lot of them will fail, but some of them will succeed. And, and you need to then find the ones that are successful and un understand why and nurture them. And they're the ones that are really going to be, in the end, they're going to create your sea change that you want. Oh. I, I want to check on questions. Oh, down. we have some <laughs> questions. I want to get you into the conversation, so. Because we don't have a lot of time left. 15 minutes, right? Here. Good, thank you. Uh, to Joe, would it be possible to map historic buildings in cities in a way that would help identify those areas with dynamic uh, redevelopment potential? Uh, good question. Uh, it's a data limitation issue. I mean, individual cities can do it. A city planning department can do it for their city. Uh, the one limitation on our work is, as I enumerated in the criteria, is we're trying to do something that we can do pretty instantly with a, available secondary data for the whole nation. Now we have actually one, one indicator that sort of gets at that, which we look at street connectivity, and it turns out that pre-war, pre-World War II neighborhoods were built along a grid pattern, and since then we've deviated from that. Um, and it turns out to be a pretty good marker uh, of vibrancy, or at least one, it's one of our candidates that we're looking at. Uh, the proposed research is very quantitative in nature. How will you include qualitative impacts, and what do you hope to find in these qualitative impacts? Well, I think it's fair to say that we are, we are very quantitative. Um, one of the things, Carol, as you know, that we're doing with the Art Place projects to look at individual projects is having a parallel uh, data gathering effort that's project specific to, to ask about change on the ground in communities and engage uh, our local partners who are actually carrying out the projects to describe, for example, as Kimberly did, sort of the more qualitative things that are happening. Yeah, and, and those, um, I think there are 10 things, Bridget? And they're posted on our website, right, Tim? Uh, somewhere, yeah. can you tell me where? On the LOI page, uh, yeah. So if you look at artplaceamerica.org, you can see those uh, qualitative indicators. And they are, they're meant to be self-administered, uh, observable things that would simply suggest to you that things are moving in the right direction. Um, again, consider, if you go back and think about the slide Joe used on the principles uh, that we're uh, testing our methods against, uh, in terms of transparency and, and so forth, one of the things that we've assumed is we're really asking our partners, is, which is what we call grantees, to collect uh, no information, uh, and we are we are not we are not collecting at our place any information ourselves. Instead, we're letting we're using data sets that others collect on a regular basis. <laughs> And, and we can use that data to compare uh, places nationally. Exactly. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, it, it becomes far too costly, something we can't support, takes money away from grant making and puts it into, you know, sort of data, uh, data collection that we don't think is actually necessary. It would be great to have if you had all the money in the world, but we don't. Um, how are you considering equity as part of your vibrancy indicators? Uh, you didn't get a chance to talk about the diversity index, and so I, I want to put that question to you, and there's a, a, a companion question. How are you adapting your indicators for rural areas? Uh, two great questions. One, we have developed a parallel set of indicators uh, that look at the racial and, economic racial and ethnic diversity of communities. 
uh, and their composition so that we can measure change over time. And then also the income diversity of communities because we know concentrations of poverty have a number of very negative effects that amplify the negative effects of, of poverty itself. So we can track using those two indicators things that are happening in all the all the art place neighborhoods. Um, the second point was on rural. Um, our focus is on relatively small geographies in an urban setting because we think most of the impacts will be highly localized. So we look at those, for example, 800 meter um, square grids that we use in a metro area. In a rural area, we'll be looking much, much more widely. So we'll be looking at something like five miles or 10 miles. And that's one of our research questions is to decide on what the kind of appropriate uh, geography is for uh, rural analysis. Kimberly, in the uh, Anacostia project, you said it was temporary six months. So what follows this project? What happens after six months? And what do you expect to have happened or, or have happened at the end of six months? Okay. Oh, actually, that, that project is three, three months um, for, for the Luminate project. And, you know, really, um, you know, one of our core operating principles is to partner with um, local organizations. So I mentioned Arch Development Corporation, and 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 so what what happens next is I think that we're building off of a lot of the momentum that um, has already sort of been in the neighborhood with a catalytic project that really sort of uh, takes it up a, a notch and the exposure um, to the area from folks that haven't been familiar with Anacostia. So um, several of the artists um, will be more than likely um, continue on in some shape or fashion in Anacostia. They've been working um, self-employed um, in terms of studio space. Because our partner owns some of the properties, there is um, an opportunity to continue on based on um, you know, their, their agreements with Arch Development Corporation. Um, but more. I think most importantly, it's 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 you know the the possibilities are endless right now, and we're, there's so many things going on, and we want to leverage, continue to leverage the momentum of Luminate with other things that are going on in Anacostia. This is one of several things, um, uh, some arts and cultural related, some not, but there is a link, and I think that we're doing better with building um, the linkages between arts and other aspects of community life. Uh, Joe, why is, and Kevin, I'll ask you the same question, why is economic revitalization or value important? Uh, what about quality of life, uh, safety, cleanliness, good schools, et cetera? Um, I'll give you both a shot. Yeah, I think, it, well, I, I, I think the, the, the premises there about quality of life will get captured in some of the other vibrancy indicators. But I mean, that's, it, it's a precept of, of real estate economics that if the values are going up, up it's because people want to be in that place. And you know, obviously different people choose different places for different reasons, but, but the vibrancy of the area, the quality of the schools, the quality of life ultimately show up in, in the marketplace. And then we have challenges, as you've described in, in Acostia, of you know, how, do we, how do we make the housing stock available for, for people of all income ranges, which is one of the reasons we're looking at the income diversity measure. Right. Kevin? Um, yes, ditto. I mean, I, I'm not sure. The, the, only thing I, the only thing I would say is, I guess additionally, the other thing, I mean, I, with quality of place is incredibly important, but, um, and it also have, helps to increase the values, but the values, the increasing values themselves also mean an increased tax base, which means you have more money to then also improve quality of life even more. So there is, there can be um, at least a, a somewhat virtuous cycle that gets created with this, or um, you could end up uh, with the unfortunate circumstances that are happening in like Detroit but uh, we'll let you deal with that one. Uh, Kimberly, a question for you. What is the relationship um, between the performing arts and visual arts in your spaces? Have you found that the performing arts drive traffic to the galleries, or can the galleries thrive on their own? And is, there, is one more important than the other? That's an interesting. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Um, Do you know? You know, I'm, I'm, I don't think I do know. Um, but I, I would say that, you know, in that project, that the galleries, um, you know, they get a fair amount of foot traffic um, because of our marketing and the, the, the promotion. The performance artists 
really just add to that. And depending on who the artist is, you know, they, they draw their own following and their crowd. So I think there's some cr cross fertilization there. But with the performing arts, that's more episodic. And um, you know, knowing who's going to be there when definitely does help drive um, larger numbers. But because of where those um, uh, pop-ups, uh, gallery spaces are located, they're on pretty visible, um, they're on a visible corridor. So um, I'd say that they, they, they're doing okay, but the performance, um, the performances, the performing artists definitely increase foot traffic. You know, this is, this is one of the issues, this is why it's so interesting to me, it's one of the issues we've been dealing with at Art Place. We have a funder, a very generous funder, uh, who is only interested in uh, funding performing arts. And um, so a lot of performing arts organizations have come to Art Place and uh, with the expectation that what we really mean is capital projects. So, you know, place, capital projects, but that's not the intention of the funder nor our own intention. But I think you, you are right. Again, that's why we have this question about intensity and constancy. How do you, uh, you know, how do you maintain over, over the long term? And I think there's some really, exciting, interesting uh, work to be done in this area for performing arts organizations that want to tackle that alongside us. And uh, we would love to work with any of you who have ideas or proposals about that uh, in our next round, because that's something that, that we don't know nearly enough about, and we're not getting enough proposals from the field uh, that adequately address that. So, so that could be a really exciting thing. Maybe, maybe we should find something to do together. Yeah, I mean, I also wanted to say that you know where these spaces are located are, are is really important for the visual artist. That the spaces are um, you know convenient to um, uh, uh, transit. That they're um, with other things. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Keeping you up. <laughs> no. that, that they're around other businesses. So the locations, like when we look at where these um, pop-up temporiums are gonna be, location is very important. And our research, the research that this panel has talked about, location is, is really drives foot traffic often. Mm -hmm. And where it is, and that, you can, that it's accessible. Uh, one last question for Joe, and then I want to do a round robin on the, on the panel. One, one last question. Joe, art place indicators sound more closely aligned to nightlife districts uh, for a transient population than cultural vibrancy for people who are rooted in and invested in a community long term. Um, can you speak to that? Sure. Um, and then there's an assumption here that that is the correct um, proposition, so I'm going to let you address yeah. it first. Yeah, I'd say, again, keep in mind that the indicators are not to, to pick particular areas, but really to measure change over time. So are places becoming more active along a whole continuum? So an art place area may not be a, ultimately a nightlife area. We're looking to see whether it changes over time in a direction that's consistent with, with more, um, more activity, more people, more vibrancy. Um, the second thing is we're going to, we do have a whole series of indicators and part of our task tomorrow is sit down with a panel of experts, some of whom here are here in the room, to uh, talk about which indicators and, and how much weight to put on each indicator to come up with the answer uh, to that question. Okay, great. So uh, just as a last um, a parting shot here, if you were to give arts leaders one piece of advice, uh, on how to make the case for the value of the work they do, um, what would it be? Joe, I'm going to start with you. Um, I, I think it's to, to, to recognize, and, and we've been talking about arts in a couple of ways. One is, you know, arts is a, is a production part of the economy, and artists produce things and sell things and are engaged in economic activity that way. But um, arts are also, I think, an, an, an integral piece of what defines um, the part, the consumption part and the social part of, of a community as well. And I think that's really in many ways what we're trying to pick up here is, with, the, with the vibrancy indicators is to get a sense of the, of the depth and richness of um, sort of cultural consumption, to, to put it in quasi-economic terms, that is going on in particular neighborhoods. And to recognize that that's, a, that's something that, that citizens in a community value and that interacts with the way the economy works and make, makes, makes the community work better uh, over time. Kimberly? 
And that's really well said. I mean, I would really echo, I would echo um, a lot of what Joe has said there, that you know, for arts leaders that, you know, there isn't really, um, what I'm finding, because I'm not an artist, I'm not a creative at all, really, um, that, there's, that there's more that unites us than divides us. And you know, up until this project, you know, um, for me personally, I think the conversation, the arts community sort of over here, and then sort of community development folks or planners are over here. And there's actually you know, a lot of synergies um, that really, you know, we, we complement one another really well. And I think that that's something that you know, arts leaders should be approaching their planning offices about you know, what are you doing um, in the neighborhoods or arts leaders looking at the small area planning work or the neighborhood revitalization plans. Because I can guarantee you that maybe not in all of them, but and more, more often than not, there is a role that can be, um, that can spark change. And oftentimes it can be catalytic change depending on you know, the neighborhood and the size and scope of you know, what the arts community has. So I'd say that, that uh, it's unifying. Mm -hmm. Sue? Um, and not that dissimilar. I mean, I think focusing on the connections again, um, how all of these different aspects uh, can work together. Um, because if you have all these multiple partnerships and you have a lot of social engagement and you mix that all together, then your chances of it, you know, uh, uh, really um, catalyzing all sorts of other benefit, um, benefits to the neighborhood, I think, are far greater uh, just because of the amount of people that are going to be involved and going to be excited about the work. So, I mean, again, I think exactly what you said. It's about connections between people and ideas and um, institutions and neighborhoods, maybe adjacent neighborhoods together, even regions. So it is about connections. Yeah, and just to make a point, when Kevin said this uh, the first time, it made me think, um, you know, when you're working on the ground in a local community, um, you can never find money for the connectors. Right, I mean, uh -huh. so the connectors are always, they're Sue, right? They're uh -huh. Sue Mosey doing something else, and then she becomes the connector. And it, it oftentimes occurs to me, it's like the connections are really valuable, the connectors are valuable, but there's never, you know, like where's the grant category that says connectors? Um, <laughs> and and I, I, I think there should be, really. There, uh -huh. there needs to be more money to be, we need to be more intentional about the value of that and, and accomplishing that. But Kevin, I, I want to give you the last word. So uh, I want to go, uh, the numbers are important. I'm a statistician at heart um, and in practice, but I want to go a completely different direction. And that is, I think you need to tell the stories. It, it, there is not a one of you who is going to leave here tonight and not remember that when Illuminate Anacostia happened, that Mama's Kitchen had the best night it ever had. And, and, and the reason, that, I mean, the numbers, I think you, the numbers are important and you need the numbers, but you also need the stories, especially because if you're dealing with politicians, you need it in nice, small little bites and things that they can use and talk about. The, the reason why silver bullets are so important is because politicians love to be able to point at things and say, I did that for you. But the other thing they love to do is they love to tell stories. Look at the people that the president right, puts up next to his wife when he's giving the State of the Union address. But stories are incredibly powerful things. And if you don't tell the stories about your organization and the people you're reaching and the things that you were doing, you are shooting yourself in the foot and doing yourself a huge disservice. And so you really need to tell those stories. Thank you. Please help me thank our panel. Thank you so much, Carol and Joe and Kimberly and Sue and Kevin. Thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I want to thank again the MAS staff, uh, especially Mary Rowe, Ann Coates, and Christine Krish for their tremendous work, the MAS board, and especially uh, the MAS Leadership Council, which is supporting our work in arts and culture. And I hope you'll continue to engage with MAS in our work and continue to attend the arts forums when they uh, commence again in the fall. Please join us outside for some refreshments. Thank you. Thank you.